thank you very much for your uh, kind invitation. Uh, my background is uh, kinetics, uh, biophysical chemistry, and um, I've been working on circadian rhythms for some time, uh, involved in negative feedback regulation, and uh, after, the, after some years I have now worked together with a group in control engineering, and we were looking about these negative feedbacks in a control theoretic way. So the goal of our research is to see how can reaction kinetic conditions uh, lead to robust control in cells and in organisms? And how can these kinetic conditions uh, can be represented by control uh, engineering concepts? When I first met uh, my colleague at Stavanger, Tomu Drangstig, he, he spoke in another language than kineticists did. He talked about integral control and these things, and, uh, and we tried that together to translate it into, into kinetics. So our main uh, ob objective is that of homeostasis, uh, which was defined in a seminal paper by uh, Walter Cannon in 1929 where he uh, describes homeostasis as the coordinate physiological processes which maintain most of the steady states in, uh, in our um, organisms within uh, narrow limits. And what you see here is uh, typically uh, the blood calcium levels uh, which are for, for humans uh, starting at the birth and then at the age of 19, 90, and you see that the uh, blood calcium levels, they are pretty much between 9 and 10 milligrams per deciliter blood. So what we looked at is a situation which could describe that. And already at Cannon's time, the concept of negative feedback arose uh, due by Norbert Wiener, cybernetics started. And in the upper row here, you see a uncontrolled system. We have a system with a, control, with a species A, and clearly, if uh, dependent on the inflow and the outflow, you will have a, a uh, different uh, concentrations in A uh, described by the ratio between uh, the rate constant K1 in and the rate constant K2 out. So if they are approximately equal, you get then a concentration which is approximately unity. If one is dominating, then you either have lower or larger concentrations in A. So in order to counteract that, you introduce a negative feedback in order to um, control the concentration of A. And one is based on what we call inflow control, which means that you have a, a controller, very often a transporter, which uh, pumps A into the system and keeps it at, a, at its lowest tolerable concentration. So the stop sign is indicating that this is based on a negative feedback. On the other hand, you have also an outflow type of controller which uh, enables you to keep A at the maximum tolerable uh, concentration. But also this is based on the negative feedback. And in this sense you, you get an a area of A with acceptable A levels, but whenever perturbations drive A outside this uh, area, either to low levels or to high levels, then when it is going to low levels, the inflow controller is activated and pumps A into the system, either from an internal or external uh, reservoir. On the other hand, if the A levels become too high by perturbations, then you have the outflow controller activated. So in this way, you can get um, a, uh, acceptable A levels. We have been looking on uh, the negative feedbacks from a relatively simple point of view, that is we have created a two-component negative feedback structures 
and if you allow only signaling from E to A and from A to E with the, these components, you get eight basic negative feedback structures. And please note that uh, the, the dashed lines here, they represent signaling events. That is, there is a signaling from E going to A, activating e, A, and A might signal back uh, and uh, is decreasing the activity or the concentration of E. Now, these signaling events can be either positive, uh, that is activating, or they can be inhibitory. So please note that uh, negative feedbacks do not necessarily include inhibitions, but they can also be uh, uh, can also be uh, occur due to activations, activation reactions. What you see here below is that how control engineers would term that what is integral control. Integral control is a negative feedback loop where you have the um, control species, in our case A, which feeds back and compares its value to a set point. Now you calculate the difference of your set point as the error, and then you integrate that error. Now that integrated error is used to compensate for the perturbations, and when you do it, then you will see that A is approaching its set point. The color coding which I'm using here translates these control engineering concepts into the reaction kinetic terms. And what you see here in blue is the signaling from A to E. Uh, in red, the reactions which create the set point. In green, then the signaling from E back to A, uh, the compensation reaction which compensates for these perturbations. And then we have the integral controller, which, which makes it, which has the property that A will robustly go to the set point, uh, A set. And in kinetic terms, you, you can identify different situations where integral control can happen. One of these situations, which I will concentrate here, is the zero order either degradation or inhibition of, of, the, um, of the controller molecule E. Uh, you have also a other way to get integral control, and this is by autocatalysis <coughs> or by a positive feedback which acts uh, on E itself combined with a first order. A degradation. Uh, in order to show you that uh, a little bit in more detail, I'm using here this type of inflow controller. We have again uh, our uh, control engineering scheme. And if you look at the kinetics, these are the kinetics of the process. Uh, these are the kinetics of my controller molecule E. And if I assume here michaelis menten kinetics and that the binding of E to, this, to the degrading enzyme here, which I did not specify explicitly, uh, is, is strong, that is we have a, a small Km, then we can say that E divided by Km1 plus E is approximately 1. And that can be, and this equation can then be reorganized and put into a, a what is called a canon, canonical form in control engineering of uh, where you have the set point of A minus A, and you see that the concentration of E, which comes up here, is the integrated error of, uh, of that feedback. And here you see a simulation with a set point of one for this type of controller, inflow controller. What you also see is that when the inflow concentrations uh, become uh, very high, then the inflow controller breaks down. And that is understandable because you can't compensate for something which is added by adding even more. So, uh, so that's the reason why the inflow controller breaks down. Uh, 
Likewise, uh, the outflow controller uh, described in, in this way by two activations is providing a robust set point as long as the KM here in, uh, in this scheme is, um, is small compared to the concentration of the And again, the outflow controller breaks down when uh, you uh, get outflow perturbations uh, which are higher than the inflow uh, perturbations. I've made uh, a, 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 a brief overview about what, uh, what are they, how can we uh, describe uh, integral control in terms of uh, these equations and with the associated um, uh, kinetics or reaction kinetics. And we can uh, find four different uh, scenarios. One is what I already showed you, the zero order kinetics. Uh, and this is the system block or the description of uh, the controlled variable. There can be much more added to that than simple A and E but here we only have the A. Then we have the controller species E, which in this case takes this form, this is a constant, uh, and we have here the set point either for the inflow or outflow controller minus A. Another way is the autocatalysis, when, there is, when E is produced autocatalytically, and then you get here, then the, what you have here is no longer a the E dot, uh, which is integrated, but you get the logarithm of, of, e, of E dot and uh, integrate that as the error. And then last year, another group by um, Mustafa Kamsch from the ETH in Zurich, they uh, published another type of uh, con a controller, integral controller, uh, which they called antithetic, where uh, transferred into into our system, there is an a additional uh, product D form which reacts with E, and in this way, when D feeds back into the uh, control into into the A, then you get uh, uh, homeostasis. And in this case, the control block looks like this. Okay, uh, I think the concept of inflow-outflow control is important because it reflects what is going on in a material system, in a chemical system, because concentrations can't be negative. So if we combine inflow and outflow controllers, for example, uh, the controller motif 1 with 5, which I've shown you, then you get precisely the situation which you observe, uh, let's say, in the blood, in the blood uh, calcium situation, that is that the controllers maintain a, um, a optimal uh, area in A where, which are tolerable, but whenever A goes outside the bounds, then the controllers either remove or add A uh, to the system. And in this way, you can uh, maintain a robust homeostasis within certain uh, boundaries, as you saw in blood uh, uh, calcium. Uh, this is only a tank analogy. My co-worker, uh, Toymut Drangstig, he has actually a water tank and illustrates that by uh, the water tank, this type of uh, homeostatic behavior with perturbations of flow in and flow out, out of the tank. I think also the combined inflow-outflow controllers are important to visualize that physiological controllers often come in antagonistic pairs. And I want to show you here the, uh, the blood calcium pair, which is the parathyroid hormone, which is important for the uh, increase of calcium in the blood the calcitonin uh, controller or uh, hormone, which is uh, related to the removal of calcium and, uh, into, the dif into different tissues. And you have also these degrading enzymes. In blood glucose, of course, insulin glucagon. In mammalian iron, 
DRP2 and FERP14 uh, as the transporters. For example, in blood calcium, if you look at the literature and scan through uh, negative feedback motifs, you see actually an overlay of two negative feedback motifs for uh, blood calcium. One is that calcium activates a, uh, the PTH, uh, and uh, otherwise that it also inhibits its secretion. So there is a compl complementary uh, negative feedback which acts simultaneously. I also would like to mention, for example, in mammalian iron, that in many iron transporters, many iron transporters have this inherent negative feedback where you see that the transporter itself is subject to metal iron degradation and in this case causing a inflow type of controller. I would like to briefly mention, uh, illustrate that with a system which we have studied which is the plant iron uptake regulation. This is a system very similar to where the transporter is uh, IRT1 in plants and uh, also iron is, uh, is in the soil, it's, it is heavily bound as iron oxide and plants use uh, therefore I think an inflow type of controller in order to maintain their iron concentrations. This is an uh, overview of actually the two major players in uh, the iron homeostasis this is an overall uh, player which is called FIT, which is activating and, uh, the IRT1, and IRT1 is the transporter which is transporting iron into the system. And it has been found that iron will inhibit uh, the uh, expression of the FIT gene and, um, and um, thereby regulate its uh, concentration. And that we have implemented in this scheme which you have here. We have a transcription factor. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the fit uh, mRNA. We have the fit protein. The transcription factor binds to the fit protein, which activates the, the transcription of IRT1 mRNA, which then leads to the protein, which is then uh, going into the into the membrane and acts as a transporter. Uh, while we were studying that, we saw uh, another paper coming up which described another um, negative feedback loop in the plant iron homeostasis, and we called that at that time an auxiliary feedback. So this is again a sort of an overlaying uh, motif or two motifs which act together in all and enforce each other in, uh, in maintaining the iron homeostasis. Uh, what you see here, these are experimental results from different labs. Uh, they are more or less on a semi-quantitative level. These are generally uh, uh, northern blots or western blots where you uh, see the mRNA levels of IRT1, uh, the IRT1 protein, then the mRNA of uh, the FIT and the, uh, the protein level of FIT. So uh, what they see is that whenever there is a shortage in iron then the, the transport is upregulated up by FIT and FIT seems to have another a variety of other functions related to uh, to the uptake of iron. So what we what we did is we first modeled uh, the the first scheme. This is again a semi qualitative modeling. You see here the uh, little uh, iron here. You, we add the iron to it. We see iron goes up, and we go precisely back to the homeostatic level of iron. Uh, what you see here is the concentrations transferred into gray scales in order to map the, uh, uh, the experimental results. Uh, 
And when we add the auxiliary feedback to it, then we see there is a dramatic change in the response, how the system responds. It, it is much more responsive and keeps the cytosolic iron concentration at its, uh, at its post set point. Another system I would like to show you is, this comes also from higher plants, is that in higher plants nitrate is under a homeostatic regulation. Uh, in higher plants, uh, ni nit um, nitrate is that um, compound which is stable in the soil, which the plants take up, um, which they uh, assimilate and reduce and use it further. Uh, it is taken by a, two transporter systems. One is called a low affinity transport system, where the, the flux in into the cell is uh, first order with respect to the concentration of the external nitrate. So this can be, in a way, modeled by first order kinetics. The other uptake mechanism is a high affinity transporter like Michaelis Menten kinetics, which gets uh, then uh, saturated. Once it is taken up, iron, uh, uh, sorry, ammonium is stored in the vacuole, and it can also be remobilized. Um, iron, um, Nitrate is also moved to other uh, parts in the plants by, uh, <coughs> by the simplest and is also subject uh, to efflux. The experimental results leading to the uh, nitrate homeostasis in plants is due by the, the group of uh, Tony Miller at the Johninne Center. Uh, he and his group, they're using microelectrodes specific to nitrate and they can see, uh, and these are double-barreled uh, uh, electrodes, that is, they can measure both the nitrate and the pH, and can say where in the cell they are located, either in the vacuole or in the cytosol, because the pH in the vacuole is uh, much more acidic. So what they, can, what they find is they can monitor the levels of nitrate when there is no nitrate outside, that is the remobilization of nitrate from the vacuole into the cytosol. This you see here, while the uh, cytosolic nitrate levels are maintained. And this can be observed both in roots and in leaves, and the average nitrate concentrations in, in the roots, for example, is that uh, about 4 millimoles. So we constructed a model based on a combination of these negative feedback uh, uh, um, schemes. Uh, we have three inflow type of controllers. I don't see, I, I don't think you see these numbers here, but these are the set points for these controllers, and I will come back to that. And we have one outflow controller, one efflux, and we can identify now the uh, different uh, genes which are associated with this um, inflow and outflow. Uh, this is again the model. Um, what we have done here is we have three inflow controllers. What we will model is the following. We will start with a high external nitrate concentration. That means that the low affinity system will take up nitrate and the homeostasis is maintained by an efflux of nitrate out of the cell. At the same time, we also assume that the store is empty and we give the store a maximum capacity of 50 millimolar uh, such that uh, this is uh, the capacity which the store can take of nitrate. Then we have also an inflow controller from the store into the cytosol. And we, I have had di slightly different um, set points for these controllers in order to see what, when the individual controller is becoming active. So for the efflux controller, I have a set point of four. For the high affinity transport system, uh, where it, 
the set point is 3.75. And finally, for the inflow from the vacuole into the cytosol, the set point is 3.5. So if you start out with a high nitrate concentration, high external nitrate concentration, what happens is the, the low affinity transporters take up the nitrate and the efflux will maintain the nitrate concentration at 4 millimolar. At the same time, this scale gives you the external uh, nitrate concentration, which is, we start with 10. And it gives you also the vacuolar concentration at 50 millimolar. So when we start out, note the store is empty, so we start getting the store um, at its homeostatic set point of 50. And at the same time, the nitrate concentration is maintained at 4 uh, millimolar. Now, the concentration of external nitrate decreases. So the low affinity transporter no longer can take up the nitrate. So it has to switch to the high affinity transporter. Now, this switch is then seen here. And we see here also the change in the set point because I changed the set point here to 3.75. Now, the high affinity transporter takes more or less all nitri external nitrate out of the cis of the nitrate out of the external environment. And at some place, uh, it can't really maintain anymore the, uh, the homeostatic level as 3.75. So what happens then is that the cytosolic nitrate concentration decreases and reaches the set point of the inflow controller, which then maintains the uh, concentration of cytosolic nitrate at 3.5. And of course, the uh, the content of the store will diminish, and then when it is uh, depleted, then of course everything uh, goes down. And here you see the modeling of uh, the vacuolar nitrate, which how it goes down. You see the nit still the nitrate efflux. In the experiment, this is actually a, a model, uh, model calculations from an experiment which has been done. Uh, it mimics also the experimental observed nitrate efflux when you go from zero, uh, when you go from, let's say, 10 to uh, zero millimolar nitrate in the external environment. And you see how uh, the cytosolic nitrate concentration is maintained. So we concluded that when uh, you have low external nitrate, the nitrate homeostasis is based on an inflow control. When you have high um, external nitrate concentration, then it is maintained by an outflow control. But this is another example. This is uh, a, from a cooperation with a, uh, with a French group where we look at pathway switching. So what ha happens here is that sucrose in higher plants is homeostatically regulated uh, but at very low nitrate concentration, uh, you get a pathway switching in the primary carbon flux, which is maintaining growth uh, mostly, to, a, to secondary metabolites, to the secondary uh, uh, carbon flux. And what you see is in order to maintain the sucrose homeostasis, in the absence or when nitrate is very low, the pathway diverges into from the primary sea flux into the secondary uh, sea flux. And here you make compounds like lignin uh, phenolics. And you see it also in uh, seedlings, for example here in Arabidopsis seedlings, that when there is sufficient nitrate, they uh, look, uh, they have greenish, but when they have low nitrate, these phenolic compounds, anthocyanins, then uh, make a, 
a, a, a, a color, you get a reddish uh, color in that. And you see this typical pathway switching which occurs when the internal nitrate concentrations no longer can be maintained at its homeostatic level. Um, I would also show you uh, a situation which is related to oscillations. Control engineering try to avoid oscillations uh, to, um, when you discuss things with them. But I think nature is mostly oscillatory. And uh, what we see here is a, a, uh, a controller motif 2. This can oscillate uh, in the case when we have relatively a low Km values here. And we can show that the average concentration of the regulated A is related to the set point. You see that here in uh, this calculation. This is an extension of uh, Goodwin's oscillator. Goodwin's oscillator has been used uh, for many, many years as a simple model system. Okay, as a simple model system for a uh, for uh, circadian rhythms. And you see here that when the system is not oscillating, you maintain uh, homeostasis at the set point of two. Then it becomes oscillatory by an increase of the perturbation. Then we, then we get that. So what we have done also is. Uh, we observe that, that the frequency of that oscillator depends on the average concentration of the controller. So what we have thought about is, well, what happens if we control the controller? And what you will see is that we actually now get a robust frequency homeostasis in our system. A part of maintaining the homeostasis of A and E we also maintain our homeostasis in the frequency. And I think this type of control system is very important where you have frequency or period control in natural systems like in biological clocks. Well, to sum up, negative feedback structures have been presented. I hope you take with you that negative feedbacks are not only inhibitions, they can be built up by activations. Uh, the combined controller motifs can depend on environmental conditions, integrate different processes, storage, remobilization, while keeping homeostasis. And controllers can work both at oscillatory or non-oscillatory conditions and may show in combination frequency, uh, robust, uh, frequency homeostasis. And the term set point can be still given a precise meaning even under oscillatory conditions. I need to acknowledge my co-workers, Professor Thomas Drangstig. I had a terrific, I have a terrific time discussing things with them. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, previous members of my lab, uh, previous PhD students, and present PhD students. And thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, in interest of time, we'll have for one question and then we can discuss in the break. So I have uh, one. Yeah. You, uh, you linearized with the... No. No, in the... I was just thinking of Michael's hand. Yes. With the concentration. Yes, but the, it's yeah. the Km, what, yeah. we, what we think if the Km is sufficiently low, yeah. then you uh, get a... a that's in, in the ideal is then you get an exact set point. But generally, the Km is not is a certain number, let's say 10 to minus 3. Then you have an area when the controller will start and uh, getting, uh, getting into action. So the Km is sort of a measure of the error which the controller can provide. Now that can be... Uh, for the other type of controllers as for the autocatalytic or for the antithetic controller, uh, you do not have the, uh, these type of errors. Right? So the control mechanisms are slightly different. Okay, so uh, thanks again. Okay. Uh, we have 
have this for you also. You fax some power bank. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So now it's a uh, poster session. Uh, and the speakers for the next session, can I watch me here? And we can find out how the technique is working. So please enjoy it. Discuss the poster. Thank you.